Um, what I'm going to do here is uh, blast through some tips and tricks for using GlyphWorks. We'll do the same thing again tomorrow for Design Life. So these will be very much test, squiggly line focused rather than Design Life FE model focused. So let's just take a look at some of this stuff. If anything here pops up as being, wow, you know, hang on a second, then let me know. And, and we'll take a look. We have time here. Okay? So here we go. This is going to go kind of fast. Ready? Okay, so here we go. All right. So first off, where is that one glyph? You ever wonder where glyphs are? Okay, they're kind of in, in order of input at the top and output at the bottom and glyphs in the middle in the middle. If you ever wonder where does graphical editor sit, that's a common one. Where's graphical editor? I can imagine it would be in this palette or maybe that one. Go to a palette and click on the letter G on your keyboard, and it'll take you to the first glyph that starts with the letter G. Okay, now how exciting is that? See, I told you this wasn't, you know, we got a minor clap in the back there, a golf clap. Yeah. So we're going to work up to the big overhead clap later, right? We're just, it's going to grow a bit. Uh, anyway. Um, if you ever wonder what a glyph does, tool tips. So hover over a glyph and it'll tell you what is this glyph actually doing. This is, doesn't stand long enough to read. Uh, good question. Yeah. Um, move your mouse just a little bit back and forth then. <laughs> and then you got to strobe your eyes. It'll all work out just right. You get a timing light connected to your VGA output. It's get it just right. Yeah. Screen capture, there you go. Screen capture will do it as well. As a matter of fact, yeah, where'd you get that idea? <laughs> All right, thanks for the input. Exactly, if I <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you find a glyph, right? So if you see a glyph, you wonder what it does? Tool tip. Uh, let's look at this other way. What if I want to do something, but I don't know where the glyph is for it? This search palette, this normally says glyph works. It's the standard glyph palette. Drop down here to search, gives you a keyword search here. And this will find all the glyphs that are described with that word. Not just glyphs that have the name vibration in them, but anything that has to do with the term vibration. In other words, if I tool tipped over any of these glyphs, somewhere in that paragraph would be the word vibration. So this is a good way to go find a glyph if you have a concept in mind but don't know where it sits. What else? Make up your own glyph palette. Okay, so if you go to the standard glyph palette here and say, I'd rather create my own, rather than seeing this, now we can see this. Here's my collection. These are glyphs I don't use very often. These are glyphs I use all the time. So mix and match that way. Build a glyph palette, save glyphs to it. Those are the two steps to this. Save your own glyphs. Build a glyph palette, save glyphs to it, or save your own glyphs on the glyph palette, on the standard glyph palette. So rather than always using the glyph called frequency spectrum and changing stuff on it, instead change stuff on it, save it back here under its, it's going to be the death of me too. Um, you guys saw that coming, didn't you? Someone could have said something. Never mind. Uh, but save your own glyph as a, yeah, I know, <laughs> that's right, that's right. 5% will never even know I was talking. <laughs> never mind. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. All this stuff, saved glyphs, um, layout of the glyph palette, layout of windows, all that stuff is saved in your home folder, what's called encode home. Let me just show you where that is real quick here. If you take a look in GlyphWorks under Tools, Settings, you'll have this thing here that says, here's your home folder. If you go look there, you'll see a bunch of stuff, and you'll see some subfolders here that represent all the glyphs you've saved in different palettes. So if I look there, for example, I would see, let's get this thing off here. My glyph palette had some other things in here like, move feature list, 3D coordinate transform, gear damage, all of that, I can find that content all sitting in my ENCODE home folder. That also includes things like how, is, how are my windows laid out. So if you, have, if you get a new computer and you want to set up Glyphworks to look like your old computer, go find the ENCODE home folder on your old computer, copy it, 
and paste it into the uh, same similar location on your new computer. Answer your question? Okay. All right, moving on here. We're doing a time here. All right, we're going we're okay on time. All right, what's next? Um, how to connect glyphs. Uh, you may or may not know this. If you drag a glyph directly from the glyph palette onto a pad, you get the glyph and its connection. If you drag it anywhere else and drop it, you'll have to connect yourself. So you can save yourself an entire mouse click by dragging onto a pad instead of dragging onto the workspace. Right? So if you get paid by the mouse click, don't do that. But this is one of these things every once in a while someone says, I didn't think you could do that, and they've been using Glyphworks for 10 years. There you go. Tip. Uh, here's another way. This is one, I'll be honest with you, I just learned this one myself. Another way to, um, I'm sorry, that's the next slide. Before we get there, adding glyphs. Drag in, another way, right click, insert glyph. Here's a list of all these glyphs. So you don't even have to have the glyph palette available to get glyphs onto the screen. This also helps answer the question of where is that damn glyph? If you can't find the graphical editor glyph, right click, insert glyph, here's the list. All of these are sortable. So I could say sort alphabetically, go find the one called graphical editor, and insert it. So this way I can keep the glyph palette turned off if I want. Earth shattering stuff, isn't it? Just monumental. Maybe not. Okay, um, this is the one I was uh, trying to lead into just a second ago. This is one I just learned about the other day. Um, if you have a bunch of glyphs on the screen like this, you can right click on a pad and say connect. This browser, or not browser, dialog box pops up and says, you're connecting this to what? And here are all the available glyphs that could take that input. Highlight one on the list, click OK, and then automatically a pipe will be established to go from one to the other. That is really, may not seem like a very big deal if you're connecting that to that, but if those two glyphs are very far apart in the screen, scrolling across the screen sometimes can be a bit of a pain to connect to your studio display glyph at the other end. So instead, just use this dialog here to make a connection from a glyph. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Did you already turn in your survey? Huh? Did you already turn in your survey? No. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> you can write that one down. That's a good suggestion, though. It is, it's a very good one. What else do we have? Um, what's up with all these pads here? Why all these pads? Strain life. Stress life, fatigue lifts have a lot of input pads, a lot of output pads. You mouse over them, you'll see what they're supposed to be for. The red one here says rainflow histogram. By the way, just very simple. Blue is what in Glyphworks? Time series. Red means what? Histogram, so frequency spectra, rainflow histograms, and so on. Green means what? Okay, there are some other colors that you don't use them very often. So the key ones are green and red and blue. Blue is the biggest one, probably green and red after that. Glad to see you guys know that. Um, glyphs can be renamed. So right click, rename a glyph. No reason to have butter with filter one, butter with filter two, copy of butter with filter two. Also rename them something useful. Leave yourself a trail. Uh, Chris Poza from Ford today talked about how his analysis that he did, he wanted to make sure you could come back and redo it again in the future. So add glyphs and name them to your advantage. Also, there's this option now called info on a glyph, kind of like putting uh, words on a cell or a, a call out on a cell in Excel. Info on a cell, a little pop-up comes and I can type what I want to in here. From this point forward, this glyph will have this little icon on it, this little I. So click on that and then if I can't describe what this glyph is doing in words there, I can describe it in paragraphs or sentences there. Steve. I believe it does. The question is, if I save this glyph back to the palette, its properties and so on will be as I set them. Will the info be set as well? I think so, but I don't know for sure. Or another way to put that is, I probably knew at some point, but then I forgot that. Uh, keyboard shortcuts. This is the best stuff for you guys to read on your own. Uh, other available windows. I'm used to using just the available data window. 
in the glyph palette. As a matter of fact, I even, you can undock, and I move this one over here so they're tabbed, just to save screen space. A couple other useful windows. Um, property editor. This window down here now is like I clicked on the properties form for that particular glyph. There are certain glyphs that have GUIs. Time series calculator, for example, has quite a large form to it, quite a large GUI, large number of functions and buttons and stuff. That does not fit down in here, so this, is, this will only show the traditional properties form with the pick list kind of stuff, not the full dialog GUI kind of interface. This one down here is the diagnostics window. This just tells me what's running, how long it took, any error messages will be reported there, and so on. This is not unique information, but it can be useful for looking at what took so long to run, where are we currently, how far into the run are we right now, that kind of thing. Uh, matrix view, this is the available data window. There are several ways that we can take the available data window and turn it on its head. Typically, there's a data file and channels underneath it. There are right-click options in, that include view in different ways, these grouping options to say, rather than having a data file and channels, let's turn it around and say, here's the channel and here are all the data files that contain it. So it's just taking a parent and a child and making them into a child and a parent. Likewise, this matrix view here is the same idea, but going even further. This says, here are the data files and here are the channels by name. And anywhere we see a, a, a gray circle, it means there's content that's that channel, that file. By channel name, by channel name and file name, there's content available there. I can highlight these, drag and drop in, and I get those channels to work with. Yeah. So. If you have consistent naming, channel naming conventions, this can be very useful to look and see how was the data I collected yesterday different than the data I collected today? Did I drop out a strain gauge? Did I add some GPS channels? That would show up very quickly in differences of filled in or not filled in. If you don't have a consistent channel naming scheme, then don't do this because every unique channel name will appear here on this list. All right, moving on. Uh, hopefully by now you've seen this. We've talked about this as a tip more than once before, I think. If all I want to do is plot this data file, rather than dragging it in, creating an input glyph, maximizing that kind of stuff, just highlight the data file and hit the viewer up here. That'll make this viewer pop up and it's got the same controls as you would find in a time series input glyph or an XY display glyph. Just a quick and easy way to get to just plotting a data file. And depending on what I pick in this list, when I say viewer, either one channel, multiple channels, multiple data files, multiple channels will come up. Depends on what I've got selected in the available data window at the time. Steve? Let's find out, does that work for the matrix view? Yes, that does work for the matrix view because we still have that viewer image up there. Yep. Uh, preferences for displays, we could talk until a long time from now about ways to make this plot look like exactly what you want it to. So if you make this plot look exactly like you want it to, right click save as default configuration. That means every new display glyph, not the old ones, but every new one, will look like this to begin with. So if you really want to see green and blue instead of red and blue or vice versa, graph paper turned on, turned off, logarithmic axes, three channels versus four, whatever it is, make those changes, right click. That's saved in the ENCODE home folder of your installation. So from this point forward for you, your plots will always look like that. Uh, that restore is the easiest thing to do is to go and find in ENCODE Home, go find the configuration. It's, there's like a, there's a, a file there that says here's what this custom configuration looks like and delete that. There's no, there's no button on here that says unsave as default configuration or restore to 
to standard configuration. Do the backdoor route instead. Uh, okay, how about this? Double click on a data file in Windows to plot it. So Windows associations, double click on an Excel spreadsheet, double click on a CSV file, it opens up with something. Likewise, file formats, certain file formats like this SIF file can be recognized with a double click will open up with the ENCODE viewer. There's a uh, little executable you can run in the ENCODE install that will allow you to associate different extensions to this viewer. So you can decide whether double clicking on a SIF file opens it in Infield or opens it in GlyphWorks. It's your choice. Here's this little bit here that says what types of files do you want to open up? What extensions should be opened up with a double click? This is the way you set that. Uh, there is, by the way, a free ENCODE viewer. If you have somebody near you or a supplier that just needs to plot something, just needs to look at squiggly lines, you don't need to use GlyphWorks to do that. There's a light install. It's like a 30 megabyte install. If you go back 20 years ago, somebody would probably choke if you said a light install at 30 megabytes, but that is really truly a light install these days. Um, you can download it. This is unlicensed. So it'll allow you to, to plot, do all the plotting and that kind of stuff that you're used to doing in this type of, a, in this type of window. John? All right, great. No download necessary. So it's apparently on your USB stick as well, this ENCODE viewer. Uh, talk to your IS group about that. Uh, I believe Uh, likewise, double click on a flow to open up the process in GlyphWorks. So if your current scheme is launch GlyphWorks, browse to find a, a flow or GlyphWorks process, you can get there the opposite way just by double clicking on a flow. This is registered with Windows to open with ENCODE. Several different options for saving with or without data. Save the process as a template. Save the process with data. Save the process with data and pack it all up into a little zip file so you can ship it off to some nether corner of the world for someone else to work with. So I like to think of this as a template here, a project here with stuff inside it. That's the difference. So if you double click on the flow, yep. do you have to click on the flow and then associate certain programs? No. The, ins the question is, do I need to tell Windows anything to make sure when I double click on this, it opens? It opens an ENCODE. The answer is no. This came in, so when, uh, on install, we register something with Windows that says this, uh, there's this file association. Now, we didn't used to do this, so if you try to double click on a flow and it doesn't open, it's probably because you're using an older install. Like I think we started doing this at ENCODE 7 or maybe 8. So in the last two years, we've probably gone to this. Has your experience been this? Oh, that's odd. Yeah. Uh, Paul, you want to take a look at that some, at some point with Sarvesh? OK. Uh, OK, here's one adding available data. You, you may be used to um, selecting a folder when you start ENCODE and say, where's the data? It's in this folder. This is open data files. This has a number of filtering options. It's, you can't see it behind this orange oblong thing, but I only want to look for SIF files. I only want to look for Excel spreadsheets. I only want to look for files of a certain name. Here's another cool option, recurse subfolders. It says, look from this folder on down. So look at all content going down from here. Rather than looking for files in a folder, look from this point down. So if you want to look busy and drink coffee, you go point to your H drive <laughs> or somewhere out in the network and say, just go look for files. And it's going to go off and look for a long time. And then that's when you can put out a single piece of paper on your desk, put your feet up and say, GlyphWorks is way busy, man. <laughs> I'm doing everything I can, waiting as fast as I can. So don't do that. Don't do that. That's jeopardy to your paycheck. So what I'm saying is from this folder down, that can be very powerful if you like, look at a project folder and look for all the data files from that point down. That can be useful. Uh, right click option on a data file, statistics. 
max, min, mean, sample rate, all that kind of stuff. Just a reminder of what data was collected uh, and so on. Um, and this has export and copy functions to Excel if you want to put stuff into Excel. Uh, what else? I'm going to skip over some of these. Uh, I guess this one's useful. Um, every input glyph has the option to save the test list that's called. In other words, when you reopen the flow, this will remember what you worked with last time. So next time you open the flow, you don't have to drag and drop files into it. It'll be pre-populated. It's a pre-populated glyph. So you can say, remember what was there before. Steve? Yeah. So how is this different than save with data? Save with data says that every single glyph will have stuff in it when I reopen it. Display glyphs, all that will be populated. If I say save the process, none of the glyphs will be populated. I have to drag data in. If I save as a process with this set, then this thing, when I open it, it'll say there are two data files in here. It'll say the last two data files you used were called such and such, and they're in there already for me. But I have to run, hit the run button for everything else downstream to populate. Save with data does this as well. This is like save half with data, somewhere between the two. Uh, mark sections to analyze, so this says, out of this SIF file or time series, I only want to analyze this bit, highlight it with the control key. This is the frequency spectrum just for this chunk. Uh, what else? I'm going to skip through some of this here. Uh, when you're troubleshooting with a metadata display, refresh button repopulates this without having to rerun the process. So if you have a process together and it's producing errors, it doesn't calculate something for you, you're trying to dig in and see what data is in there right now, metadata display refresh. It's like running the whole process just for this glyph, and it magically gets past errors. So it'll say, what's in here right now? It can be very useful for troubleshooting what's in this pipe right now. For example, I may find my fatigue calculation doesn't work because my Excel spreadsheet didn't have a material set for channel 89. I can look in here. What's the metadata that describes channel number 89? I, was, had, I thought I had fatigue, fatigue material properties associated with that. I may find out that I don't. Therefore, the fatigue lift can't do its thing. This is useful for troubleshooting. Uh, using metadata is an example of using, there we go, using a test splitter to find strain gauge data. Look in the Y units for anything that contains the word strain. Micro strain, strain, strain gauge, that kind of stuff will all pass through here. So this is an example of using metadata to your advantage. It's not necessary to do this. But this can be very useful. It's a good way to step ahead into a, an advanced use of GlyphWorks. We'll skip that one. What's that? Uh, that one's too complicated to show on the slide. You could, though it, Phil just pointed out, you could use this Glyph to look for UE or microstrain. We can't use this GUI for it because this, if I type in strain or microstrain, it's going to say look for any channel to contain that stuff, strain or microstrain. I can pretty much guarantee you no one here has probably ever labeled a strain gauge channel strain or microstrain. If you want to do or, and, that kind of stuff, you have to use this advanced tab to do so. You can use and or conditions in there. You can also use multiple test splitter glyphs in series or parallel to do the same type of thing. What else do we have here? Uh, have you guys ever noticed these buttons here? This stuff up here? This is uh, zoom in out. A lot of uh, office applications have gone this way with the zoom slider bar. And then this one turns off all the toolbars. I've used that a number of times today. I don't know if you guys noticed that or not, but it turns off all the toolbars temporarily. So you give yourself more workspace to work with. Help on a property. Every single property in GlyphWorks has right click help enabled for it. So what does averaging method do in FFTs? I have two options, and this is what this one does. That's what that one does. Every single property has that. Some of them are quite verbose. Some of them are very succinct. Um, but every single glyph has, every single property in every glyph has this enabled. Uh, if you want to know more about using GlyphWorks work examples, 
Uh, GlyphWorks includes 24 work examples. Design Life has 21 of them. It's a tutorial, walks through some use case, how to use GPS in uh, GlyphWorks, how to use string gauge data to predict fatigue life, whatever. How many people have used these, by the way, work examples? Okay, great. Uh, some people are, are uh, very focused on learning this way. Read something, try it, give it, give it a, a, a spin. That's great. If you're not, we have other ways of learning, training classes, this kind of thing, and so on. Fatigue theory guides, both for GlyphWorks and for Design Life, if you ever wonder, what does this mean stress correction method mean in the strain life glyph? Fatigue theory guide will help you with that. Property by property inside the glyph, what's going on there? If, you're, if you want to learn in a training class, I've seen a lot of you guys in training classes, and that's awesome. If you haven't been to a training class, I suggest you take a look at some point. Our office is a quarter mile north of here, and uh, we do training classes four times a year there. That's for GlyphWorks, for Design Life, for um, Fatigue Theory. If you want to know more about the concepts of fatigue, we do those four times a year. Those are open enrollment. Uh, we can also do training classes for you guys on site as well if it's easier economically for a group of you guys to be at your spot. We go there as opposed to a group of you guys come to us. Lastly, tech support. Paul in the back. Paul's got the blue shirt on. Right? You guys, I assume a number of you guys have talked with Paul at some point. Somebody like that. So there, Paul's part of our support team. I am as well. Chris Gray is. Chris Gray was here. Chris Gray is in the back. He spoke earlier. Right? So we have uh, a number of application engineers to help with tech support. So just remember, you can give us a call, drop us an email, and we'll try to help you. There is no um, level of support like you know, gold and bronze and turd you know, colors kind of thing you know, for you know, these various you know, computer tech support is terrible, period. So we're trying to elevate that experience by keeping people engineers that understand the stuff you work with here, face-to-face, -face, phone, email support. So please make the most of that. That's something you guys, as paying customers, have access to. Paul, anything else you want to say about support? Got it? Okay. All right. Questions? Questions? 